Now starting, all attendees are in listen only mode. Good day everyone and welcome to another ARM Meet the Experts webinar. Today's topic is adding Bluetooth 5 and 802.15.4 standards to your next SOC. Uh, I'd like to remind you before we start that you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenter. You can do this by typing your questions into the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, you may send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address them during a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter and a, a bona fide expert in the field, Mr. Charles Dittmer, Senior Manager of Technical Marketing for ARM's Wireless Business Unit. Take it away, Charles. All right. Thank you, Eric. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we'll jump right in, and I do apologize for this uh, first uh, slide. It's a quintessential marketing slide, and we'll get into more technical detail as we, we get along. But um, most of you have seen uh, multiple slides uh, like this, um, really depicting the forecast of phenomenal uh, growth in, um, in IoT uh, endnote devices. And whether you believe this is one, 1 billion or 2 billion or, or 20 billion, um, there's certainly a huge opportunity for low power SOCs uh, in this growing IoT market. And the key thing here is the majority of these will require some uh, sort of wireless connectivity. Um, so, you know, RF and analog design is very difficult. Uh, I've worked for a couple of different uh, wireless uh, startups in my career and know that it takes uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, to bring a product to market, uh, at least two if not three or four years for multiple spins to get something that is uh, working correctly and, and um, you know, competitive in, in the market space. Um, so how does the average SOC uh, designer and vendor jump into the space? Well, really, for many of those folks, the, the only way is to license radio IP. Uh, to jump into this uh, arena here very quickly. Uh, on the converse, we, we have a lot of good ARM partners that license uh, ARM um, cores that are already in the wireless space, and we are actually talking to a number of those that are looking uh, for better ways to um, utilize their internal resources and, uh, and potentially leverage some of our offerings to uh, jump into some new features, um, you know, um, more quickly in the marketplace. So um, this talk applies to them as well. And um, just as a general introduction, for those of you who don't know, uh, ARM has introduced a um, wireless IP family uh, called Cordio. We'll be talking about that. And it delivers a uh, one-stop shopping for end-to-end uh, -end low power radio solutions that, be, uh, that can be very quickly and very easily added to an SOC with, without really any prior RF design knowledge. So uh, with that, let's, let's move on and talk about some of these wireless technologies. Uh, 2006, uh, uh, the changes going on this year and, and the following years will uh, generate additional demand and utility for uh, these IoT wireless applications. So let's talk about two prominent uh, low power technologies that you may be aware of. Uh, the first one um, is Bluetooth Low Energy and specifically uh, the new standard that the Bluetooth uh, Special Interest Group, or what we uh, simply call the Bluetooth SIG, um, has announced uh, this year as Bluetooth 5. Um, this is the specification for this is actually expected to be released here in the next couple of weeks. And from a Bluetooth Low Energy uh, perspective, there are um, three key new enhancements uh, to the Bluetooth low energy spec. One is uh, increasing range. Um, extending range will deliver robust, reliable IoT connections uh, that make uh, full home building and outdoor uh, use cases uh, a reality. Uh, the, spec uh, the second is speed. Um, it will increase the speed uh, that supports faster data rates. Uh, this means um, faster over the air software updates and also optimizing responsiveness uh, in many applications. Uh, the third major enhancement is messaging capability. 
uh, increases eight times the broadcasting message capability and allows uh, Bluetooth to transmit, uh, transmit richer and more intelligent data. Uh, Bluetooth 5 will uh, further drive the adoption and employment of beacons and location-based services in both home automation, enterprise, and industrial markets. Um, increasing message cap uh, capabilities uh, or capacity enables users to move away from the app, and pair, uh, app paired to a device model to a connectionless uh, IoT situation where there's no more uh, need to download the app or make physical connections to devices. Uh, an example of this, if you've uh, downloaded a recent Chrome browser for either iOS or Android, uh, you can turn notifications on and actually um, see beacons and other devices uh, in your, in your ge uh, general neighborhood. All right, moving on, uh, let's touch on 802.15.4 a little bit. Um, we just uh, call this 15.4 uh, for short. Um, it is certainly a uh, proven standard for the home. There's a lot of products over the past years that have been used uh, both in uh, consumer and commercial applications. Uh, 15.4 is actually a, a radio and Mac specification and is the platform for both Zigbee uh, and thread stacks to run on top of that. So when we talk about 15.4, we're really talking about both Zigbee and thread. And uh, I guess what's new in the Zigbee world is they have unified a lot of the applications or usage mod, uh, module into a, um, a unified standard uh, called Zigbee 3.0. And for those of you uh, new to this place, um, Thread is a uh, fairly new uh, IP-based uh, protocol standard um, that supports uh, six low pan, uh, where all the uh, end nodes are IP addressable. Uh, this alliance uh, was started uh, with seven uh, founding companies, uh, ARM being uh, one of those. So let's, let's talk about uh, several considerations for uh, selecting radio IP. Uh, the first being, of, of rega regardless of what low energy standard you're going to use, um, you have to be uh, very much involved in um, the organizations, alliances that develop these standards. Um, you know, there's if you're not uh, involved in these organizations, specifically in the working groups that develop the new standards, uh, there is no way to find out any uh, details to start developing uh, your solution to address uh, to address these new enhancements. So, in 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 the Bluetooth case, uh, you not only have to be uh, a member of the Bluetooth SIG, uh, you must actually be a active participant in the working groups for each one of those individual enhancements to understand what's going on. So it's very important to um, be an active member of that. It takes a lot of resources and a lot of time. Uh, here's a summary of uh, what ARM is involved in. As you can see, we're actually uh, one of the key board members of the Bluetooth uh, SIG board of directors and chairing some of the working groups and, and obviously participating in, in many of the, uh, the others. Uh, likewise for THREAD, uh, again as ARM is a founding member, uh, Bill Curtis is our secretary, is a secretary of, of, uh, in on the uh, THREAD board of directors and we're involved in uh, some of the other um, working groups and, and, and committees. So if you hope to bring uh, all these new enhancements uh, that are going on to market in a very, very timely fashion, uh, the key message here is you must be uh, involved in these working groups uh, very early so you can be developing uh, the solutions in parallel with the uh, specs coming together so when the specs are released uh, you basically can um, ship um, at, at the same time. And um, the nice thing about this for licensees is uh, ARM is doing all the uh, heavy lifting and attending all these uh, working groups and participating and driving and defining a lot of these standards um, so you, um, our licensees don't have to spend a lot of effort in, in doing so. Okay, moving on to some considerations is uh, one is just pure RF performance. And in the Bluetooth world, uh, especially Bluetooth Low Energy, the Bluetooth SIG has an RFI test specification 
And this basically uh, defines the various criteria for a radio to pass the Bluetooth qualification uh, process that I'll get into uh, a little bit uh, more in the, uh, in the next couple slides. Um, these tests are all run by the use of uh, DTM commands or direct test mode commands that are defined in the Bluetooth specification to exercise the radio to perform these tests. Um, and, there's a, and there's a number of uh, transmit tests and a number of receive tests, but pretty much the high level one that everybody zeroes in on uh, to quantify radio per, uh, performance is received sensitivity. Um, on the TX side, you certainly want to be aware of the solution um, is a, a 0 dBm transmit power, potentially a 4, up to 10 or even 20 dBm. Uh, that can always uh, be gained up by uh, various methods. But receive sensitivity really uh, dictates you know, uh, or denotes how good a radio is. And if you're not familiar with this, um, with this term, receive sensitivity is is really not your uh, is your ability to listen, not uh, not not transmit. So uh, we always think about range and transmit power uh, that you can always gain up, but the ability to listen um, is, is extremely important for range and uh, throughput considerations. And as a general uh, rule of thumb, um, uh, you know, greater than uh, minus 94 uh, dBm is considered uh, fairly competitive. Our solution is, is better than that, but uh, in recent years with the improvements, anything below uh, minus 94 is, is uh, starting to be considered um, subpar. Another very important um, consideration is power consumption. And for Quite a number, uh, I won't say all, but quite a number of these IoT-related applications that are emerging. Um, these are battery-operated devices, and so power consumption is extremely important in, in the terms of battery life. Uh, what you see on the right is um, the power profile of a Bluetooth solution that is uh, beaconing on the three advertising channels. Those are the, uh, the, the three... Um, uh, transmit uh, spikes you see in the power consumption there and the, and the smaller spikes after each one of those longer spikes is, is received that after a device transmitted it, it then listens to see if there's a uh, request to uh, uh, for connection. Um, the, the very important thing to remember with Bluetooth low energy and why, um, why it is um, so low energy and why small batteries last for uh, months and even years versus days is that Bluetooth low energy uh, in most applications is typically off uh, over 99% of the time. And so if you're off, you're, you're obviously not consume, consuming any power. And so the, the, the sleep power is extremely uh, important because you're in, the, in that mode, um, you know, some 98, 99, 99 and a half percent of the time, depending on your uh, your, your transmit intervals and your application. Um, um, but you can see uh, with our Cordio solution um, that we're down into 800 nanowatts. Uh, so what this, uh, what this means is, is longer battery life. Uh, on the left hand side, you probably noticed uh, both in the one volt uh, battery domains and the three volt battery domains, our uh, Cordio uh, BT4 solution is best in class in, in power consumption. And another important takeaway on this is that you really have to also um, compare solutions uh, milliwatts to milliwatts. Um, our solution here runs at a, uh, a native sub, sub one volt uh, solution. Um, it's been out in the marketplace for a couple of years and was, was really the first um, and only sub one volt solution uh, at the time. Um, and, and so running at 1 volts, um, in the case of TX power, uh, 7.2 milliamps equals 7.2 milliwatts. Uh, most other solutions out there, uh, whether IP or existing uh, Bluetooth solutions out there, quote their TX powers and sleep numbers in milliamps. And so you have to determine are they running at 2.5 volts or 3 volts, and then you do the simple math. and. Um, um, they're usually over uh, 10 milliwatts transmit power and uh, over a, a milliwatt in, in sleep mode. So, again, when you're looking at uh, IP solutions, please, 
please do the math and compare milliwatts to milliwatts uh, to, to get an apples to apples uh, comparison. Another very important uh, consideration is small footprint. And so this is, um, this is viewed in a couple of domains. One, one actually at the SOC level, you must consider uh, the entire uh, footprint as, as far as uh, on, your, on your die. Um, and you, you must include um, you know, the whole Bluetooth radio solution. Uh, this includes the uh, analog front end. Uh, the digital mo domain, and even in our case, we were adding uh, pad rings and, and the bonding pads into the solution um, that, that goes straight out to the carrier. So um, be careful in looking at, uh, at silicon uh, size and make sure that it uh, you know, includes everything, including uh, clock and, and even some uh, uh, power management um, um, circuitry. Uh, also, from a cost perspective, very important to uh, consider is the number of external components. Um, a lot of solutions out there um, have external um, uh, ballums and other devices, um, additional uh, power filtering, uh, load capacitors on crystals and whatnot. And so um, you, you want to look at the, the total footprint and also this is cost for the SOC customers. Uh, in these very sensitive uh, cost app, uh, applications. And um, so our solution is very highly integrated and we have eliminated a lot of the external uh, components um, that need to go down on the circuit board around the SOC um, to eliminate uh, both size uh, and cost. Another key consideration uh, when looking at the uh, licensing radio IP is, um, is one-stop shopping. Uh, in our case, we have a full radio solution uh, or what's called a radio uh, or controller subsystem. Uh, it's basically antenna all the way through uh, into the SOC side, including the stacks. So you're including the baseband, the link layer, modems, uh, RFI, um, and the entire solution. Uh, other solutions out there are only uh, licensing the, the, the digital side, which is the link lane, the baseband, or more the uh, typical radio analog front end, uh, where, uh, consisting of the uh, RF and typically the modem. So uh, if you're familiar with the Humpty Dumpty effect of trying to put pieces together, obviously um, um, this induces design risks, uh, respins, performance degradation, schedule slips, uh, can um, even introduce qualification issues. Um, so be careful on um, whether you need a whole solution or just part of the solution, uh, taking something that, that um, you know, is a complete solution that you know uh, works and doesn't um, require any assembly. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Bluetooth Low Energy uh, 4.2 products. Um, this is uh, not trying to be a commercial, but more of just a baseline of understanding. Um, here's a, um, our Bluetooth 4.0 solution. Uh, we announced this uh, over a year and a half ago, about a year and a half ago, in April of 2005, uh, when ARM um, kind of came out of stealth, uh, stealth mode and announced the formation of the wireless business unit. Uh, it consists of a uh, full Bluetooth Low Energy self-contained uh, radio subsystem which uh, contains the RFI, the baseband link layer controller, and the firmware that controls the link layer. Um, this is offered as a hard macro at TSFC 55 nanometer. It's optimized for low power as you've seen from the previous charts. Um, it contains its own clock and power management unit. It's a, really just a complete uh, pre-done, pre-qualified uh, radio subsystem. Um, and we call this a known good radio. It's something that you drop on the corner of your SOC and interface to the, uh, the Ambilight uh, interface bus. Uh, we also offer a full complete uh, Bluetooth low energy stack uh, with quite a number of profiles. Uh, this is um, pre-qualified, uh, and so you can essentially 
take the stack, take the radio IP, and on the far right hand side you see an example of uh, Bluetooth Low Energy SOC where the radio IP and the gray on top is simply interfaced uh, on the AMBA3 interface bus like any other peripheral and um, our licensees then uh, pick their um, uh, their host uh, MCU uh, in the uh, lower blue section and whatever uh, additional memory and I.O. they want to uh, add to it. So as, in a summary, uh, uh, as a summary here, um, here is um, kind of the highlights of our 4.2 offering, uh, complete blue low, uh, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Connective Solution, RF to stack. This is done all in-house. It's Bluetooth qualified, uh, has superior uh, best-in-class battery life, um, and very important with radio, it's, uh, with radios, it's proven in silicon, um, and it enables small, cheaper, and more uh, reliable devices with uh, less components. So some, uh, from there, let's move on to supporting uh, Bluetooth 5, as I mentioned uh, in the onset, and uh, 15.4. So this is a very interesting slide that I took some time to uh, put together. And let's, let's talk about standards enhancements. Uh, what you see there is a standard Bluetooth stack. Uh, the green areas on top run uh, is, is software, the, the host stack and profiles that run on the uh, host CPU. And then in Bluetooth world, there's a very important HCI or host controller interface. This is basically the logical and physical interface between the stacks running on the host uh, MCU and then the, the radio or what we call the uh, controller subsystem underneath that consists of the link layer, uh, the PHY, and the radio front end. So if we look at um, the Bluetooth 4.2 enhancements, which were added this time uh, last year, uh, you see some of those um, mainly um, being added to the host stack where you really don't uh, have any considerations or any need to um, do any changes to the uh, radio and link layer. Um, anything really below the HCI interface has a good possibility of requiring a hardware spin. This is a little dependent on the actual uh, radio design, but uh, typically a lot of the enhancements, uh, as I blow this out, uh, that were added in 4.2, and more importantly, the three main Bluetooth 5 enhancements that I talked about, um, require changes to the link layer and down in the protocol processing on the PHY area to support these, um, these enhancements. So, uh, these most likely in any design will, will call, cause a hardware spin. And if you look uh, on what is coming in the future for Bluetooth, uh, most, most likely most of the enhancements that we are aware of that are going to be coming out in the next couple of years uh, will require uh, changes that will, that will drive hardware spins. So the final takeaway of this, um, and really the, the whole purpose of this, is if you look on the far left, um, is that most of the standards enhancements um, are in the digital domain. Again, a few um, affect the upper stacks, which are easily uh, changed. But what's interesting note, uh, to note is the, the analog front end uh, really remains constant. Uh, we've seen that with 4.2, we've seen that with Bluetooth 5, and we expect that to continue through uh, future Bluetooth enhancements. So if we go back to what we introduced to the market uh, a year and a half ago with the Bluetooth 4.2 solution, what we've done here at ARM is try to capitalize on divine, uh, design flexibility and fast time to market. So what we've done is we've split our radio IP in really two halves. The first being the analog uh, RF front end. If you know anything about uh, RF or analog design, um, these are very fab uh, dependent, not only fab, but node uh, dependent. Uh, they do not shrink as you, as you move to um, uh, smaller uh, topologies. Um, so we are still planning on delivering this as a hard macro in GDS2. Um, 
for specific uh, fabs and nodes. Uh, on the converse, on the right-hand side, the digitals or the standard enhancements, we deliver as RTL. And uh, again, as a quick time to market, uh, what this enables is we can spin the digital side and RTL very quickly uh, for a time to market com uh, um, uh, competitive advantage to bring these new enhancements and new standards to market very, uh, very quickly and independent of uh, additional ports to uh, additional fabs of the, the analog RF front end. So um, what we introduced uh, about a month ago at TechCon and what we announced is really a new line of Cordio IP products. Uh, what you see on the left is full subsystems, uh, controller subsystems, um, and we're not only supporting Bluetooth 5, but adding support, uh, support for 15.4. Um, this can be licensed um, as either Bluetooth 5 or 15.4 or licensed as a combo solution uh, supporting uh, both radio technologies. Um, what's also interesting uh, on the right-hand side, and, and this is, uh, applies to a lot of people that are already in the Bluetooth business that, that have a good uh, RF front end, that are, are looking for additional functionality or, or time to market, advantages by licensing the, uh, the digital side, which, which has the new enhancements. Um, this also enables us to um, uh, support third-party radios uh, with some of the partnerships that we've announced that I'll, I'll touch on here uh, very shortly. So looking at the front end that we announced, uh, we um, are still supporting TSC 55 uh, nanometer. We've announced uh, new radio designs at TSMC 40 and also UMC 55. Um, these radios are not uh, sold set or licensed uh, separately. Uh, if you are interested in the RF uh, front end, uh, you also have to take the digital. Um, but um, it does enable those folks with their own front ends to, um, to license the digital uh, for time to market advantages. The other interesting thing here is we've enabled a couple of third party IP companies, uh, front end radio companies. Uh, to work with our solution. We've given them the specs of our radio front end interface and they are off developing um, radios that will work in conjunction with our, our digital portion um, that are addressing additional uh, fabs and process nodes that, that um, we don't plan to support in the near future. On the digital side here, um, uh, you can see some of the standard uh, features. We, uh, again, will license this as uh, Bluetooth 5 uh, only, 15.4 only, or a combo solution. Uh, what differs between those is what uh, really modems and FIs are added uh, uh, in the modem and protocol logic uh, area of the block diagram you see in the middle. Obviously, the link layer and or MAC changes depending on if you're running uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, 5 or, or uh, 15.4. And as I mentioned before, if you see at the bottom that the, the, the whole digital block as well as the whole radio uh, controller subsystem interfaces to the, the host SOC by uh, the simple uh, Ambilight interface. Here's a little bit uh, deeper dive on that digital section, um, and again, uh, kind of focus in on, on the center blocks of the, uh, the block diagram. Uh, you see that we offer the Bluetooth 5 modem and protocol processing logic. This includes both the standard one megabit um, um, PHY as well as the new uh, two megabit uh, PHY for Bluetooth 5. Um, it also includes the 15.4 modem and protocol processing logic there. And probably most interest there is on the right-hand side is uh, we include a schedule, a scheduler uh, to basically uh, control the airwaves to coordinate the simultaneous operation of Bluetooth and 15.4 out of the same device. So uh, here's kind of just an overall uh, summary and uh, of of the solution. Um, again, with the, the three different um, topologies and fabs we're supporting, uh, probably the most interest on this slide is performance. 
our Bluetooth uh, low energy uh, receive sensitivity is uh, is minus 95. Sensitivity for 15.4 is uh, 101 uh, uh, dBm. Uh, we're maintaining our very attractive um, low power. Uh, RX is down into the six uh, milliwatt areas. Uh, TX in the seven milliwatt. And what's phenomenal is the low s uh, sleep power that's down in the 300 uh, milliwatt range. What we also announced at TechCon at the end of October is our ra is radio front end partners, which are Katina and Aurora. Aurora. Uh, they are supporting uh, additional uh, fabs um, that, uh, that ARM is not supporting. Uh, we're working in conjunction with them to ensure that their radio uh, front ends work seamlessly with our digital uh, portions in our stack. Um, on the right side, we also announced um, some very good uh, Zigbee stack partners. Uh, we didn't elect to do our own Zigbee stack. It's, it's very mature. And between Ubisys and, and DSR have uh, some of the most recognized and uh, widely deployed Bluetooth, or I'm sorry, Zigbee stacks. Um, out on the market. Um, so we're working with them to ensure that their stacks run seamlessly on our hardware. So kind of a, sum, a summation here and what we've tried to do to not only spin the digital section very quickly for a time to, mark, uh, time to market advantage, um, but we're giving our customers uh, quite a bit of uh, flexibility. So essentially, um, they select their fab, uh, one of the three fabs we're supporting, or a couple additional fabs that our third-party radios are supporting, or in the case if you have your own radio uh, for your given um, um, fab. Uh, you can then select your features, whether you want to support Bluetooth, 15.4, or both in a combo solution. Um, the very nice thing we've added to our solution is the ability to select uh, your type of memory. Uh, some people like ROM because it is very small, very cheap, and very uh, uh, very good power consumption, but that doesn't really have the, the ability to upgrade. Other people may select uh, OTB or some type of other multiple uh, program non-volatile memory uh, to be able to upgrade their solution. So once you've picked your fab, um, your standard, and your type of memory, then obviously you want to match the stack that's running on the, the host MCU, uh, again, be it Bluetooth, uh, Zigbee, uh, and or Thread. So uh, for those of you that are new to the wireless space, uh, it's very important to understand uh, qualifications uh, and regulatory requirements. Uh, and the difference between the two. Um, Bluetooth qualifications um, are, are required. Uh, you can see by the bullets there that it is necessary uh, to get your solution qualified uh, uh, to be able to use the intellectual property associated with Bluetooth wireless technology. Uh, you must become a, a member of uh, the Bluetooth SIG, either an adopter uh, or associate member. Uh, and then uh, list or qualify your solution for the rights to use the intellectual property. Um, it's also required, uh, qualification is also required uh, to apply the Bluetooth trademark uh, and wordmark and logos to, to your product. Um, and also, uh, while there are interoperability sessions that the Bluetooth runs, um, um, getting your product qualified also promotes interoperability uh, with other solutions on the market, uh, verifying conformance to the Bluetooth specification. So um, really anybody that has a Bluetooth qualified solution out on the marketplace, whether it's, uh, it's a component or a subsystem or entire uh, end product, uh, all this information is public on the Bluetooth uh, website, which is uh, simply Bluetooth.com or Bluetooth.org, and it now takes you to the same spot. And you can look and search on, on uh, different companies and different solutions. Uh, here depicts our 4.2 um, qualifications for the profile, the host subsystems, both of those that are software that runs on the host MCU, and then our radio uh, controller subsystem um, that are 4.2 compliant with the um, solution we, we introduced uh, last year.
Now, the very nice thing about this is that while there is a lot of testing that requires, uh, that is required to go on um, um, to qualify a solution, um, it can be passed to, um, you know, down the line to other people in the food chain. So what this uh, chart uh, depicts is that our radio control uh, controller subsystem is Bluetooth qualified. If you do license it and put it on the corner of your SOC, you are not required to do any retesting. Uh, whether it's our 4.2 solu uh, solution, which is a hard macro, or our Bluetooth 5 solution, um, you really can't change anything. Uh, you don't have to go through the costly and time-consuming process of going to a accredited uh, Bluetooth test facility uh, to get this recertified or requalified. Uh, you can uh, essentially integrate our solution, reference our QDID, and go through the listing process and have your SOC approved. Uh, likewise, uh, there in the center of the screen, the stacks and profiles are qualified. Uh, and again, uh, whether you add those um, you know, into um, non-volatile RAM of your SOC or provide those to your uh, SOC customer after the fact, um, that QDID uh, can be referenced from ARM uh, and you can simply list it and don't have to go through any additional testing. Sorry about the, the arrows there. <laughs> All right, in the listing process, now this is a very important thing. While you're not required to retest uh, the use of our IP, and you can simply reference our QDID and list it, uh, you do have to go through what is called the listing process. And so um, we've obviously done that um, um, for IP. And as our SOC vendors use our radio IP and our stack IP, they can reference our QDID. There is a listing fee that is involved. Um, if you're an associate member, um, it's $4,000 per listing. Um, and if you're uh, an adopter level, it's $8,000 per listing. Um, please check the uh, Bluetooth website um, in case the, uh, they, they do uh, change the qualification listing requirements. Uh, but this has been in effect, uh, in effect since February of 2015. It's also very important that everybody in the food chain must uh, list their product, um, even if they're referencing uh, our, our QDIDs, or in the case of people downstream from the SOC vendor, they will uh, reference the SOC vendor's QI, uh, QDIDs. So if there's a, mo a module maker involved, uh, he has to list his, his product. Um, and again, the end product is basically the combination of the controller subsystem, which is the hardware and the stack and the host, is what's called an end product in Bluetooth speak. It, it may not necessarily be a user end product, but that's the classification that it would be approved at. If there's a not uh, module maker involved, um, then the, the ODM or OEM making the user end product uh, must list their product. And if someone makes a product, maybe it's a, it's a uh, fitness band or something, if that product is rebranded by another company, uh, they have to list their product as well. Now, the, the, um, the nice thing about this here is that um, no retesting is, is required by the SOC vendor. Um, if you do use a Bluetooth qualified expert, which we encourage you to use, which is someone that signs off on your qualification, when you get to the module and the end you, uh, user end product stage, they may require some validation testing just to ensure that the, the PCB layout, the antenna implementation doesn't affect the performance. Uh, but uh, in most cases, it will not require to go back through the full um, um, Bluetooth qualification process. Now to contrast that um, is, is regulatory type approval. So hopefully from the Bluetooth qualification, you've learned that you're really just testing the Bluetooth protocol, uh, protocol and the compliance to the spec. Where regulatory type approvals are uh, agency approvals um, that allow you to um, sell a product into a market uh, that complies with the local regulatory law, laws. 
So uh, Bluetooth Low Energy and 15.4 uh, operate in the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. Uh, it's available and unli uh, unlicensed in, in most countries around the world. Uh, some of the uh, spectrum allocations and some of the test requirements vary a little bit from country uh, to country or region to region, uh, but the in-country original approvals are still required to import a product into that region, and more importantly, uh, to, to sell a product. Uh, it's very important that the regulatory approvals are done at a end product level or system level, not at the SOC level. Uh, obviously, there's implications of the PCB layout, the an antenna gain, antenna uh, radiation pattern that, that can affect uh, your, your spectral output. Um, so again, this is done at the end product level. It's important to note that in some regions, some, there's additional uh, testing that has to go on um, for product safety and, 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 and um, other metrics as I'll discuss uh, in the next uh, slide or two here. So uh, who are the governing bodies? Here's a list of a few. Obviously, uh, you see the CE mark on product shipped in Europe. Most people are familiar with FCC uh, in the United States. And just about every major co uh, country around the world has their own um, regulatory body and set of criteria to get approval. Uh, now, smaller countries uh, in Latin America, uh, throughout South America and the Middle East, uh, quite often do not have their own regulatory agencies or, or test criteria. And what they simply do is they call out that you must either be uh, CE approved or FCC approved uh, pr prior to shipping into their, their country or region. So let's kind of uh, break down the regulatory compliance product. Uh, pretty much around the world, there are two types of uh, testing that's done. Uh, one is EMC. Some people call this EMI. This is a, a electromagnetic compliance or electromagnetic uh, interference. Uh, this is done on what they call unintentional radiators. These are. This is basically all electronic equipment that needs to go through this test. And uh, what it ensures is basically that that electronic equipment isn't radiating or spurring some spur, uh, spurious emissions uh, that may interfere with uh, other devices um, around it. In the radio world, because you are an intentional radiator, you are purposely uh, emitting or radiating um, energy at a specific frequency. Uh, then there's the radio uh, approval standpoint. And again, methods of, of, of testing this, whether it's done over the air or conductive, vary from country to country. Uh, but um, again, to, to be able to sh uh, ship a Bluetooth device or a 15.4 device uh, in country, you'll have to go through these radio approvals. Now, most parts of the world, you, you, you get both the unintentional and the intentional um, radiator uh, approvals, and you're allowed to ship. But there are a few, uh, a few areas, like for uh, the CE mark in Europe, uh, the CE mark actually uh, includes other criteria that needs to be uh, tested. Uh, in the case of CE, there are some safety uh, tests that must go on, uh, ESD testing uh, to ensure that um, the product is not damaged or the user is not damaged, and also some immunity testing. So this is not only the, uh, the ability to uh, withstand other interferers, but also, uh, in, like in the case of the ESD, that, that the device not only uh, is, is not damaged, but then uh, actually recovers without any user interaction. So um, it's important to understand here that for CE and then a few other minor places in the world, that beyond the, the, the RF testing, uh, there are some additional tests that need to go on. Another consideration is that regardless of the government, uh, governmental uh, agencies that, that perform the testing, there are some specific markets that have formed alliances or uh, test criteria to sell into that marketplace. Um, so uh, good examples of that is medical, automotive, and certainly aviation that has a set of other uh, type compliance or certification uh, processes um, that need to be complied with before 
the end product is sold in those uh, specific applications or markets. So let's talk about some of the additional pieces. Um, SOC vendors and their customers really must take an entire systems approach when designing a pro product. In the wireless world, um, it goes way beyond uh, just the SOC and making a good SOC um, uh, to ensure performance. Um, the, t the two things that are always pointed out is, is PCB layout, antenna selection, antenna, and antenna matching must be considered for each design. Um, basically, you're uh, out from the SOC, you are um, radiating energy um, uh, out of the device uh, across the PCB, hopefully in a short run, to the antenna. And uh, that transmission path um, typically is, um, needs to be matched uh, and um, have a clean path without interference uh, between the chip and the antenna. Uh, Coplanar waveguides are the most common, commonly used um, methodology and the thickness of the traces and the um, dielectric characteristics of the substrate based on its uh, thickness and its uh, uh, material properties must be calculated to ensure that the best efficiency of the SOC is, is radiated across this waveguide uh, to the antenna. Most uh, Bluetooth and 15.4 solutions um, require a 50 ohm impedance match to the antenna. Um, and so typically there are a few smaller components like an R solution that are external to the SOC that, in turn, uh, that um, ensure a good antenna match, uh, impedance and admittance a match uh, between the SOC and the antenna. Uh, this can be tuned by the values of the, uh, the capacitors and inductors involved. Uh, and this varies from actual, you know, PCB uh, and uh, design of each particular uh, product. Um, another consideration of the choice of antennas, um, you can give a, a, a day long or a <laughs> several month long course of antennas uh, on antennas, but uh, typically there are no perfect antennas. Uh, the selection of antennas uh, for each and every product varies based on cost implication, size, performance, directionality, uh, but these are all things that must be considered uh, to ensure the best proper performance of an end device. And ARM uh, offers several application notes and guidance in these areas for our uh, SOC vendors. Um, they can take that for the reference designs and they can also pass those application notes on to the ODMs and ODMs to uh, ensure that um, uh, they're educated in, in designing uh, circuits properly. Um, thanks to ARM's Connected Community, um, we always promote um, others in the industry and in our ecosystem um, uh, to bring pre uh, better products to market. Um, we have a growing number of, um, of Cordio uh, ecosystem partners to address uh, SOC uh, level integration, uh, helping our customers design SOC. Obviously, third party RF partners that you've seen from our recent announcements, uh, packaging houses, uh, software partners like we've mentioned with Zigbee, with DSR and Ubisys, and uh, thread, uh, thread stack partners. Uh, test equipment and certification partners, and as well uh, as, well as system level integrators. Uh, that can help with uh, antenna selection and uh, RF layout for our SOC customers and um, their customers downstream. All right, um, you know, to address the IoT space beyond the radio IP, obviously uh, ARM has um, a significant market share in low power processor cores, uh, most of these being the Cortex uh, uh, M family. Uh, for IoT applications. Um, we do have um, system level IP for interconnects, memory controllers, security, and, and physical IP, and off, uh, obviously software stacks, as we mentioned, for uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, um, uh, Embed OS, which has uh, gained a lot of popularity that includes a thread stack in that, and, and also some tools uh, and, and development environments uh, uh, to develop your SOC and your end product. 
so major takeaways uh, from this is, uh, you know, select radio IP based on radio performance, power consumption, footprint, time to market on new specification enhancements, uh, and also the completeness and flexibility of solution. Uh, it's very good uh, to start with a solution that works. In our case, we have a known good radio that's an entire system that's qualified, rung out, no assembly required, but also meets the flexibility of your needs, um, um, whether it's um, selecting your own, own memory um, or uh, the various wireless standards to address the applications that you're addressing. Uh, and what this does is minimize your design risk and time to market with a pre-qualified and pre-tested solution. Uh, we touched on briefly uh, taking a systems approach to supporting your customers, again, um, um, using PCB uh, design guidelines and uh, an antenna selection guidelines uh, to support your customers for end product. And then using ecosystem uh, partners to augment your, your solution. So um, with that, um, you can see that ARMS Cordio Solution has gone a long way to simplifying IoT connectivity uh, for both people that are already in the wireless space and for the people that are just jumping into the wireless space trying to make this um, as easy as possible. Uh, we hope uh, we have given you some points uh, to consider uh, and that you've learned what ARM is doing to uh, simplify IoT connectivity. Uh, if you'd like more information on our solution, uh, you can simply go to uh, arm.com and uh, look under wireless IP solutions uh, and there's a lot more product information um, that's available out there. Also, um, ARM typically has quite a number of uh, webinars and newsletters on uh, a variety of different to topics, uh, so if you just certainly uh, simply search for ARM subscriptions, uh, you can get all, a lot more information on, on um, other offerings. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll take any questions. Eric, do you want to fill those? Absolutely. Thanks, Charles. Uh, so I'll start answering the, the or asking the questions. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, please use the GoToWebinar control plane question section to submit them. If we don't get to them with Charles online, we will be answering them and posting them on the ARM Connected community afterwards. So, Charles, our first question comes from Vanjan Maiti, and it's, uh, why does the analog RF not shrink with the node? Uh, very good question. Um, analog design, um, it's, it's, uh, the, the performance and timing characteristics are very critical. Um, the libraries used um, um, are, are different from different process uh, nodes, uh, topologies, and different fabs. Um, the, um, just sh shrinking some of the uh, elements in the design causes um, um, significant shifts in the analog response uh, to that, uh, and thus affecting radio performance. Uh, so you really have to lock, uh, lock down the design uh, for a given fab with their libraries, with the topologies, with the size of the structures, um, and, and design. That's okay, essentially, the radio has got to be designed specifically for a given fab and a given topology. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, next question comes from Alexander Ivanov, uh, and he wanted to clarify, was it 2 or 11 external components needed? Um, it's, it's basically 11, now that includes uh, 32 megahertz and 32 uh, kilohertz crystal. Um, component and the three component match. The other couple of ones are just um, power supply filters and, and a small resonant uh, tank circuit. So uh, we support um, both one and three volt designs. So the, the bomb count will vary uh, slightly on that. But that that total bomb count is 11, and that's not only for uh, the antenna matching, that uh, includes the power management unit and and the uh, the um, clock circuitry that's included in our IP. Uh, 
Thanks, Charles. Uh, further question from Alexander was, uh, at which data rate did we receive the uh, negative 95 dBm sensitivity? At which data rate? Yes. Okay. Um, that's basically um, baselined at one megabit per second. I obviously uh, I don't know off the top of my head if, if it varies at all for the two megabit per second mode. Okay, but that's, uh, we, yeah, that's that's basically um, um, you know full performance there. Okay, uh, next from Martin Kovac: Are all SOC vendors required to be members of the Bluetooth SIG if they are using ARM Cordio? Um, the simple answer is yes. Uh, you cannot, uh, despite. Yeah, you cannot use Bluetooth, uh, low energy IP, um, and and bear the Bluetooth trademark and logo without being a member. Again, an adopter is a free membership. Um, um, it does require you to, to sign some legal agreements um, with the Bluetooth SIG. Um, the associate member uh, does cost, I don't remember off the top of my head, that can be easily found on the Bluetooth website. Uh, associate member does give you the um, um, ability to, to um, participate in some of the working groups uh, and then it also gives you a reduced um, listing fee um, and, and some other advantages. But yes, you must be a, at least an adopter member of the Bluetooth SIG uh, to, to uh, use Bluetooth IP in your SOC product even if you're using the Cordio radio IP. Thanks, Charles. We have time for one more question. Uh, just a reminder, we, we will post all the other questions with answers uh, on the community site along with the slides, um, or not the slides, rather, the recording. Uh, so the last question from uh, Olokunle Esuroso. Uh, do you include a UVM RTL test bench with the Cordio deliverable? Um. I believe so, but let's let's let me check on that. Um, we'll we'll get that answered in the in the questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Charles, and, and thank you everyone for attending today's Meet the Experts webinar on adding Bluetooth five and eight hundred two point fifty point four standards to your next SOC. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, you can post them uh, on the community page uh, where we will be posting this recording and, and the other questions. Um, we will circulate that information to you in an email uh, following this. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. And we would really appreciate it if you take the time to complete it. This uh, helps us um, steer us on, on what kind of information we present in these webinars in the future. And that follow-up email with the link to the recording will come within 24 to 48 hours after today's uh, webinar. So on behalf of ARM and our Meet the Experts webinar team, uh, thank you for joining us uh, and please enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>